what is your full name? And Wollstonecraft, and I have no middle initial. Where and when were you born? I was born in Sable, New York on December 18, 1917. Were you born at home or in a hospital or elsewhere? At home. What are your family's origins? I, my father came from England and his, both his parents were English and my mother was born in Sayville and her parents came, her mother came from Ireland and her father came from Germany. What was their trade or business? My grandfather was, uh, uh, what do you call it? He had a shoe shop but he made uh, handmade boots and he was overseer of the poor in 1900. If the family had not settled in Sable, when and where did they arrive? Or how did they arrive here in Sable? They, they, they arrived, arrived by train. And my grandmother arrived on, on the day of the blizzard of 88. What street did you live on when you were a little girl? Railroad Avenue. That was where the family homestead was. Could you tell us about Sable back then? Well, I could tell you that there were many changes that were made through the years, and uh, most of Main Street was houses and grass. And the, and the stores came later. As you know, there was a uh, Rivera Park, and that was on the west end of Sable. And as you strolled through, there was a little gate lodge at the entrance of Benson Avenue. And then there was the Royal Feast place. And then there was the Catholic uh, church and rectory and hall and school. And in 1967, the, the church was set, set on fire. The school wasn't touched, but the other buildings were all burned, but not entirely. But then the church tore down all those buildings, made that a parking lot, and bought the property on the other corner and put the church that's there now. Do you have any other recollections of what Sable looked like as you approach from Benson Avenue to Railroad Avenue. Oh, yes. And, and, and there was a... Did Jean DePay and Henry Pannenbacher had a real estate and insurance business in the front of a large building. And the rear of the building was St. Lawrence's Garage. And uh, that... Uh, lasted for quite a few years and then in between where the subway eating place is now that's that was the building and then later in between that and the Methodist Church Percy Hooks insurance business was built and then we had the Methodist Church and this is, is the four corners that we used to joke about the Methodist Church we called the meditation corner, and <laughs> the Angelica's plumbing we called the sanitation corner, mm -hmm. and on the northeast corner was a, a bar, so we called that the inebriation corner, and on the northwest corner was Dr. Merritt's home and his medical practice, so we called that the medication corner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Silly, wasn't it? But anyway, it was a standing joke. Yeah. Yeah. And the firehouse, the small firehouse, was next to the Jennifer Plumbing. And then next to that was Dow Clark's place. His house and the lawn. It was quite a large piece of property. And he, he was the president of the only bank in town. And then next to that, 
was the, what we called the Bailey Building. And in that was a tailor and a haircut, a barber. Mm -hmm. And then next to that was Stenton and Rome, and they had a place that you could take anything and they would fix it mechanically. Oh. Yes. And next to that was the Aldrich uh, home with a great expanse of lawn. And the Aldrich people owned the coal yard that was up on Henry Street because that was next to the railroad track where they could bring the coal in. And they brought the first black family into Sable. Peyton Van, do you remember Peyton Van? No, I do not. And he had a wife and two daughters, and they lived in a little house adjacent to the coal yard. And both the girls graduated from Sable High School. They were very nice people. When did you graduate from Sable High School? 1935. Oh, how interesting, yes. And uh, of course, at that time, you and your friends would have been the teenagers that upset Sable. Yes. <laughs> uh, did you have a job when you were a child? I had a job from 16 on. And Dorothy Morrison, who has been on the sea to shore, he, and, and uh, gave me a job working summers, giving out the ice cream and the keys and, and, and taking care of bad little girls like Betty Whitehouse. <laughs> <laughs> All the good children she took care of. <laughs> uh, you lived through the Depression and World War II. Do you have any memories of Sable and its people at that period in time? I was a second lieutenant in the Women's Army Corps. Oh. I was in charge of a women's company that, of a hundred women that worked in the Army Hospital outside of Fort Chris, Texas. And they took care of the wounded coming back. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, and that was, I was quite, I was in there for three years and one day. Okay. Now back a few years before you were in the Army, uh, what sports did you enjoy in Sable High School? Because somebody somewhere told me you were a star player. Did you ever talk to Jim Fallon? Oh, he, yes. He will give you a resume of all my athletic abilities. What were they? Everything. I was the tennis champ of Suffolk County. It's classic. I have a plaque for that. And, and, and basketball, I know as well. Yeah, Ellen Williamson can tell you that. And golf? Golf. Yeah, not as much golf. But. Uh, Sable didn't have golf in those days, That's did right. they? No. In fact, women had a difficulty going on a course, even, yes. in those days. That's right. Yes. Um, but today, I run a court. I run a group of women, 60 women, at the West Sable Golf Course. The pro gave me a fax machine, and I faxed the lineup down. Mm -hmm. oh. OK. And then. Uh, Gary takes me down on Thursday afternoons. I can't get to the Garden Club because he gives music lessons on Mondays. Oh. Yes. How many jobs since you graduated from high school, how many jobs have you had and what ones did you enjoy? Well, I had only three. I, I worked uh, for Lillian Robinson in the real estate office for three years, and then I worked as a bookkeeper for three years, and then I went into the post office, and then I had three years in the service, and then of course I had the, uh, the postmastership with, yeah, oh, 30, uh, with 37 men and 17 trucks. And Sables um, never had it better than when you were postmaster. Thank you. How did you get the job? 
How did you get that job? I was working in the post office, and uh, in, in those days it was political, and I wasn't a politician. Mm -hmm. But the different politicians got together and requested that the congressman name him, and they did. And he did. He told me he nominated me in one of his loftier moments. Who was he? Otis Pike. Okay. And how long did you have that position? The, the postmastership was uh, from uh, 65 to 10, 11 years. Was that in the building where Past and Presence is now? No, it, it, it's where it was when I was postmaster, okay. but when I worked in the post office. It was where? It, it was in the three different places, where, where the past and presence, and then it was in the bank building, and then it was in where it is now. Okay. Is the bank building across the street, the Oysterman's Bank building? No, no, no. The, the bank building, that, that was Chase. Yeah, that's, okay. Yes, and the, um, as far as your working career and your sports, you were really a leadership role model for many young women who then could uh, go in and try many jobs that before were not to open to them. And I remember that even before you threw me out of the Cedar Shore. <laughs> Why did she throw you out of Cedar Shore, Ben? I did. I think I was naughty or something. I did something wrong. Made too much noise, probably. Well, it was the Marine Grill. There was an orchestra there playing, and I was over in the corner giving out the ice cream and the bathhouse keys and stuff, and I really don't remember doing it to her. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, but with Morrison, I remember chastising. Oh, so, certainly, yes, and Nancy Knapp, and yes. Jackie Johnson, yes. they were, actually, they were nice people, and I was but as <coughs> youngsters, they sometimes didn't behave. Yeah, and I was allowed to use the tennis court because Jenny Lee Holland, Hollins, who was the champion of Packer Institute, requested that I play with her. Oh, I remember that, yes. yes. And you remember many activities on the bay, the, the... Oh, yes. Like the 1936 sailing at United States champion snowboats. Yes, yes. Uh, When you mentioned Jenny Lee, her father had the most beautiful motorboat. And in those days, it was a depression. How did the depression affect you and your family? Well, shall I tell you, my parents had five children, and during the Depression, my father made $35 a week. Was that good money or bad money? Back that was bad money for okay. five children. Okay. So, uh, I remember my clothes, my mother would carefully wash and iron them when I grew out of them because there were so many families who didn't have the money to buy clothes for their children. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. Yes. <clears throat> people today are now, those same people and families are now wealthy, <laughs> but they weren't in the Depression. <laughs> I, I remember where you lived on two of them, you do. Oh, you do? Yes. Oh. <laughs> um, now, uh, your fr you and your friends, what was your favorite activity? Tennis. Tennis was your favorite of all of them. Yes. Yeah. And uh, what other um, what other recreational sports or activities did you enjoy? Well, <clears throat> I'll, I'll tell you a little story. A friend of mine visited a lawyer in Garden City. And uh, she, when he said he came from Sable, she asked him if he knew me. And he said, no, I played football with her. Ah. I was a tomboy. Okay. <laughs> okay. Even I remember that. <laughs> well, where would a woman, where could you go with that talent you had? 
as a young woman with all this sports ability, could yes. you? There was no college on Long Island. Not one. Not one. Okay. It was very different in those days. The female athlete, and I always enjoyed sports too, very much, but you couldn't go anywhere. You were always second to whatever the men or the boys were doing. There were no scholarships that I knew no, of. No. Well, my friend Eleanor Jessica, do you remember Eleanor? Yes. Yeah, she was valedictorian of our high school graduating class. Mm -hmm. She didn't get any scholarship. Yes, this is it. And times, luckily, have changed. Yes. Yes. Mm. What year did you graduate high school, Betty? I'm 40. Okay. Did you go to college to become a teacher? Yes, NYU. What year, what year did you go? To, did you go right after high school? Right after high school. Graduated on D-Day, World War II. So nobody came to my graduation. Well, I didn't blame them. That was a very serious time. Oh, it was? Yes. I was up on a ladder playing with painting a ceiling. And I got so excited, I dropped off the ladder and spilled the pale paint. On D-Day? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I still remember that. My next question is, and this is a long one in a way, how has the town of Sable changed? Is it better or is it worse? And what changes have you particularly noticed? I, I, I think Sable has remained the same, and it has always been a lovely residential town. And when I was in the Army, especially when I was in Texas, and I closed my eyes at night, I tried to envision Handsome and Green Avenue and all the trees and everything because I was on the desert. I have, I, I have only fond recollections of anything about Sable. And I know that's interesting, yes. I th what do you think, though, today? I'm worried. Perhaps you are, too. Have you noticed the bacon stores with the, shall we say, slight de decline in the economy? Well, that happens periodically with those small stores on South Main Street. Oh, all right. I feel better. <laughs> it does. <laughs> uh, I have, now I was thinking of, I have come to the end of your questions. Um, what else would you like me to? Uh, Whatever you ladies want to discuss. What other, and anything else you want to mention? Is there anything else you want to bring out? Now this is for posterity, for the great Anne Wollstonecraft. Oh, so on. you, so you have to give a further speech. And you are a great athlete. You were one of the first women in the armed forces, and uh, first postmaster lady postmaster, I guess I can say that, and uh, you were well known in town, and uh, you were a great member of Sable Garden Club. Now what else are your accomplishments? Well, I wouldn't consider them accomplishments, but I, I think that, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, for instance, just thinking about South Main Street, you're mentioning it, and thinking about the people that used to be there. And, uh, Billy, Billy Boss, the barber, and Teach, the druggist. You, did you remember that there was another drugstore in Sable besides Thornhills? Aaron Burns. Yeah, besides that, Teach. Oh. On South Main Street. And, oh. And that's where Fritchie's Grocery. Bakery used to be. And I, I remember when the fish store was uh, in a different uh, location. Yes. And I think it was right next to the, uh, the bakery. Yes. 
in Pritchie's Bakery. That's right, and it was uh, striking. Yes, yes. And I also remember there was a rival bakery, Wong's Bakery. Oh, yes. Which was across the street, which caused a great deal of commotion when they started up to rival Mr. Pritchett. Yes. Do you, <coughs> excuse me. Do you remember Klingoner's? The oh. ice, Klingoner, the ice cream place. Oh, yes. Mm hmm Yes. Were you one of the noisy teenagers in that ice cream place? Sure. <laughs> yes. After, after every basketball game. Yes, that's up. Uh, and uh, the girl, the girl there that was the age of my husband, Pr uh, Priscilla was her name. The daughter of the ice cream owners. No, that, that's not quite right, is it? No. Uh, Clean it. And Crash, one of the Silliman boys married her. Dr. Silliman's, one of Dr. Silliman's sons married the daughter of the people who owned the ice cream shop. Beers? Huh? Beers. Not beers, no, the other one, the one that the high school kids used to hold. Oh, Benjamin. On, on the corner of Candy Avenue. Candy Avenue and Main Street. Mm. That was a luncheonette. Yeah, there was that, and it was also ice cream and Coke, yes. And let me ask you, do you also remember I think it must have been before beers. There was Thornhill's drugstore, but I believe it was larger than today, or maybe my memory is wrong. But I remember at Sunday dinner, nobody had refrigerators. We had ice boxes, which couldn't keep ice cream, and my father had to run up to Thornhill's to buy ice cream. They had an ice cream counter there near the, as you came in the front door. And there was only room enough for a person to walk past it. Yeah, was well, that right? Because I'm a little foggy on yes, that yes. memory, yeah. Yes, they yeah. had an ice cream fountain. Yes. Let me ask you another question. Do you recall, you do, I know you do, the Kensington Hotel? Naturally. And do you remember the department store that was somewhere near where Sparrow Park is today? Gerbis. Yes. Do you remember that? Truly. Did you go there? Truly. With your mother? Yes. And do you remember the funny way they used to pay, used to pay your bill there? They used to send money on a wire with a little pouch. Yeah, and it went on a trolley, right? That's right. And Sweezy and Patchog did the same thing. They did the same thing. Mm -hmm. Very That's, interesting. Yeah, it is. And it was, it was literally a wire. Yeah. And it was, and hanging from the wire was this little case with ball bearing wheels. And the cash and the sales lady would put your money in this little case. Hook it on to the trolley, give it a push, and the money would go tooting along through all of the, the uh, breaks in the store to the cashier who collected all the money. The sales lady did not do anything but take the money from a customer. I used to like to go in there just to watch the money behave like a trolley car. Yes. Do, you, <coughs> do you remember the pool hall that was on the corner of railroad? I missed that one. The pool hall. Pool hall? Oh, the pool hall. Sure I do. And it was wooden steps. That's right. Like in the like cowboys were going to come right. out of it. Yes, I do. Where was I'm that? afraid. Where was it? It was on where the new store is going up on the corner of Railroad and Main Street. 
Uh, the Kensington Hotel was on the other corner. Right. And, and that's right. Okay. And the Kensington Hotel was very nice. It was. And they served very nice lunches and dinners. And they let us have our alumni meetings there. Did they? Oh, yes. Ah. What was it like to live in a beach community? Because this town got very crowded in the summer and very empty in the winter, I would think, right? Because yeah, of the yes. hotels? Yes, and a lot of people rented their houses for the summer. Okay. Yes, that's it. They would see the summer people. I'm afraid I was one of those. Although my father wasn't a renter, we owned the house in Sable. But we did, uh, went back to the city in the winter because my father didn't like commuting. But uh, we'd come out to vote and come out on holidays. And I think a lot of people did. But there were a lot of uh, movie stars, opera stars, yes. in the between Blue Point and Oakdale and Sable, Sable being in the middle, there were many colonies of famous artists, uh, musicians and artists. And uh, the opera house in Sable that was on Candy Avenue. Right. Well, you tell more about it. I'm not, I'm, no, that's fine. You probably you remember, do. I don't <coughs> remember yes, it better but with than... with my voice wavering the way it is, it's better that you do it. But anyway, the opera house, I, Oldest sister graduated from high school, and in those days you graduated at, in the opera house because old 88 didn't have any place where they could do it. And uh, it, it, was in, it was in back of the stores that faced on Main Street between Gillette and Candy, and uh, they, it, it went from one street to the other. But then. And I understand you played basketball there. Oh, yes. Yes, yeah, so the Opera House served in, ma in uh, many ways for the people of Zavel. And then, let's go further. Do you remember going down Candy Avenue all the way to the Bay and the country club that was there? Of course. And yes. Our alumni association used to hold affairs there. And eventually, yes, what you enjoyed a dance there. What else did you? Of course, you know, there was a golf course right there. That's right. It can, candy, between Candy and Green, and from Maple to the Bay, was a nine-hole golf course. Connected with the hotel or not? No, the clubhouse that was at the head of this golf course, nine-hole course, uh, was to was snobby in the sense that people, uh, not everybody could belong, so which is why I'm calling it snobby. It was. Did you think so? Oh, yes. <laughs> and uh, they not only had dances there, they had movies there. I used to have movies for all the guests and their friends and at the clubhouse. And sometimes they had some stuck there. And they had bathhouses, and they had the bathhouses were right on a creek. And the people today may think to themselves, creek? What creek? Oh, yes. All the people with extremely wet Basements are built their house where there was once a creek. And the creek, where did it run? What, do you remember where it ran from? Where it ran from? No. Well, it ran from the west side of the clubhouse and the bathhouses there. There was a creek and it ran where to the west side of where this was the golf course, it would have been, it ran where it is now called Fairway West, was part of the creek. 
and that same creek went by under Maple Street, right under my son's basement. <laughs> I didn't tell him. And all the way up to Main Street, just to the east of what used to be Ehrenberg's drugstore. So they had trouble with water there. And it's interesting, of course, everything gets filled in today. And you do, uh, where I live, there are springs in the, in the, where you lived. Sure. Yeah. And let me ask you, um, then the next creek over, of course, was Greens Creek. Greens Creek. Do you remember the land, what it was like in the, well, the 30s? What it was like, where your house is now? It must have been water, because I have water. <laughs> Swamp, anyway. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Is that it? No. Nope. Keep going. Keep going. Goodness me. Okay. <laughs> it's a good thing Sayville's a popular place, and it was a popular place. And it's always been a friendly place, hasn't it? Yes, it has. In the sense that uh, people always came back to Sable, even if they had to move away for a while. And I think you must notice that. Yes. That uh, it's really been a lovely place to grow up in. And although I didn't go to school here, you did. And I bet you thought the world of the education you got. Yes. Yes, it was very good. Yeah. But back to Riviera Park, which is the area east of Greens Creek. That's right. Where you now have a water. Where I have water. Where everybody else has water, and that's the land between, would take from Main Street to the bay, from Greens Creek to uh, the backyards of the houses on Handsome Avenue. That area was called Riviera Park. And according to that map, it was called something else before, but I do not know that. But anyway, all that area, a lot of it was nothing but what today we politely call wetlands. But in those days, they called it a swamp. You know, when you come in my front door, I don't know whether you ever noticed or not, but the picture on the wall, that's the, it's a picture of Greens Creek with the big trees that were growing alongside. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes, it, that's changed a lot, hasn't it? Yes, it has. Yeah, yeah. Was, it, was Riviera the name of the man who built the homes? Was it Riviera the name of the man who built the homes? Yeah, well, Palmer bought the, most of the property yes. 65 years ago, said in the Suffolk County News. Oh, tell us a little more about that. I do not remember. I do remember Elwell Palmer grabbing a big hunk of the yeah, property. That was Elwell Palmer. Oh, I remember. Ah, Elwell Palmer. For a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Oh, well, good. You elaborate on that. No, I'm, I'm having trouble with my voice. Well, I was going to say, Riviera Park, Elwell Palmer bought a great big part of that, the part of that area I just described. Um, basically, the part uh, from Jones Drive to the bay. Now, from Jones Drive to the Bay was definitely swamp, pool of Phragmites. Oh, yes. Those dreadful invasive plants, you know, they're, they're uh, I think most people know them. And uh, he decided he was going to make the land possible to build houses on. So he hired a dredge. And he put it on a big bar. Jenny had the men do it. He just stood and directed it. Well, one day, he got on the barge himself. 
and decided to overlook where the barge was plowing the water, uh, dredging the creek so he could fit more houses and call them waterfront houses and charge more money. And so he gets on the barge. Well, lo and behold, one of the people or families that lived just south of Jones Drive, not in his swamp, just south of Jones Drive, the Van Frankens. And the Van Frankens owned what was approximately one, two, well, three large lots on Greens Creek. Along down the creek comes Elwell Palmer on his barge. Well, Mr. Van Branken takes one look, and I, I watched this as a kid, take one look, uh, ran into his house, got his shotgun, and proceeded to shoot at Elwell Palmer, of course over his head luckily. He didn't want to go to jail. And Mr. Van Branken was the most dignified gentleman. He was absolutely one of the top society people in Sable. So to see him out there shooting at Elwell Palmer, I thought was a good story to tell. Yeah, I still have the azalea plant that Mrs. Van Branken gave me when I built my house. Oh, do you? Mm -hmm. wow. And by the way, uh, Anne was one of the uh, best members switching back to gardens. Even gardens in Riviera Park were her houses. Anne was one of the best members in Garden Club. She was not only president for what, how many years, Anne? Twelve. Twelve years president of Garden Club and a very fine president. And I'm going to add that sometimes when you have clubs like Garden Club or any of the clubs in Sable, we were so lucky, I'll put it this way, we were so lucky with Garden Club. They are the nicest group of ladies who are really interested in flowers and the environment. And they try to do things to beautify Sable as best they can because it's expensive to beautify anything. And Anne did a lot, not only as 12 years as president, but then she became the treasurer. And uh, we're still going, we still get scholarships. In fact, we do the plantings at Sparrow Park. We do the plantings in front of the Gillette House now and the Edwards Homestead. In other words, they're a nice group that really work and not just sit and have tea as some groups do. They're really good workers. I enjoy them anyhow. We just had um, a garden tour this past Saturday and we joined with BAFA Group, Bay Area Fine Arts. They do the art and the music with Garden Club. We had seven houses where people could pay a certain amount to visit their garden. And in each garden, there was, there was music and there was an artist. And it went very well and it was a cooperative effort and both clubs, Bapa and Garden Club, did gain financially and uh, they used their finances for scholarship as well as beautification of the Sable area. Uh, what, I'm, I'm trying to think of some other things. That was today, of course. Garden Club, when did it start, Anne? 1924. 1924, um, I brought in um, a boulder about Flo's hot dog stand. Yes. And that started in 1926. Yeah. And Garden Club started in 24. Yes. And, uh, the, 
<clears throat> in the old days, the ladies used to wear those big hats. And uh, there was one lady, and whenever the, there was a flower show, she would, would have the Bayport Flower House fix up an arrangement, and she would bring it and put it in as her arrangement. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's cheating. <laughs> and uh, but, but nobody had the gumption to tell her that she shouldn't do it. Um, that was before my time. But, uh, <laughs> Mrs. Carl Posey, one, do you remember her? Oh, sure, I remember. Well, you can I remember, see her doing that, can't you? <laughs> I remember Mrs. Um, Rayner, Mrs. Skelton. Yeah. Uh, quite a few uh, amazing people. Yes. Well, Eugenia Reyna was a, what would you call it, a wonderful lady. And uh, when I went to get a birth certificate from my mother, they didn't have her registered at Town Hall. They had her two brothers and two sisters, but they didn't have her. So I had to get it through the Bureau of the Census. But then I had to find somebody who was 20 years older than my mother that would verify that the, they knew that this was the census of 1900, and it was a rigmarole. And when I knocked on Eugenia Reyna's front door and asked her if she could sign this paper for me, she said, I remember when Nellie and Billy were courting. <laughs> Your mom? I still remember that. Your mother was born here? Oh, yes, in Sable. Okay. What was the house like? You said there was a homestead on Railroad Avenue. It, it was right opposite the mouth of Henning Street. Which street? Henning. 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 That's okay. right below oh, yeah. the uh, railroad tracks. Was it a big priest's property? Oh, I, I should also tell you. Did you know there was a Ku Klux Klan in Salem? I did, but I'm sure people would like to know about it. Okay. Well, my grandmother uh, from Easter from Thanksgiving to Easter, when she got older, she used to go into the city to stay with one of her daughters. And uh, so fortunately, she wasn't there. But they they burned a cross in her backyard. Why? She was an Irish Catholic. Oh, you're kidding. Wow. Hmm. But fortunately, she wasn't there. But that was in 1925. And speaking of some history of about the same vintage, they, there was the Ku Klux Klan and there was Father Devine and his flock. On Macon Street. On Macon Street, yes. Do you remember them? Of course you do. Of course I do. <laughs> well, everybody, uh, really, Father Devine actually had a very nice group of, of people. They didn't, they didn't bother anybody. No, and they were very good cooks and waitresses, and you could, and they could help the ladies out when they need needed to give a party. And they were, in, <coughs> they were in a part of the town that didn't affect Macon Street. Yes. Yes, he was quite an interesting character. Yes, he was. But we were glad when he left. You built your house on where you live now? Yes. You were involved in the design and the yes. building? What year was that? 1952. Okay. What can you tell us about it? Huh? What, what can you tell us about it? Well, I picked a picture out of a magazine and sent for the plans. And <coughs> then I looked around for a lot. And uh, I saw that on Sunset Drive. So and f I found out from Charlie Dickerson who owned it, but I, I didn't buy it from Charlie because I would have had to pay a fee. And Charlie was a friend of mine, so he didn't mind t telling me. But at any rate, I, so it was John Bates who lived in West Sable in that nice house, uh, that big, beautiful house. And my father's half brother was a friend of his, James Johnson. He was at the real estate agency in Oakdale. And so I went and I knocked on John Bates' door and I asked him if I could buy the lot. And he said, I told him that 
how my uncle Jim was naturally. <laughs> and so I, for a thousand dollars I got the mark. You believe that? So John Cohallen comes in the post office the next day and I said, John, could you register a deed for me? And so I gave it to him and he looked at it and he said to me, how did you get this? I said, why? He said, I tried to buy it from him and he wouldn't sell it to me. <laughs> and I, Anne is right because uh, my father tried to buy the peninsula that divides Greens Creek and Elwell Palmer owned it. Elwell Palmer and my father were rivals. They went to kindergarten together. They'd known each other since they were little boys. Elwell Palmer being in real estate and my father, John B. Kaplan, was in the stock market. Now this is the depression in the 30s. So Elwell's banking on the fact my father didn't have any money because father wouldn't tell him he wanted to buy that peninsula. This is before he built the house on Sunset Drive. And uh, so my father had a third person try and buy the peninsula for him. For some reason Elwell found out and he wouldn't sell it. So we couldn't have the land on <laughs> across the creek from where we live today. So father thought, well, I have to outwit Elwell somehow. And so he thought, I know, the Van Frankens, same ones who had all the, the three lots at the end of Sunset Drive, just north of Jones Drive, had the three lots. But one of their, and they had purchased them, this is above and beyond their house on the creek. They had purchased them for their children, but one of the children didn't want to live there. So there was the empty lot. So uh, my father went to the Van Brankens, bypassing Elwell Palmer, and bought the lot right on the creek and built the house in 47, he built that house on the creek. But he had to outwit, outwit Elwell before he could get the land, but he finally did. What was Cedar Shores like? What was the Cedar Shore like? Well, it was kind of old. Wouldn't you say? I think so. The actual building wasn't too old because the first one, if I remember, burned down. Yes. So did the second eventually, but the first Cedar Shore did. And I believe it was Webb's maternal grandfather that original... Webb Nash. Nash, that's right. Nash, who built the original or uh, not the original Cedar Shore, but the second big building, yeah. right? Yeah. And one of the nice things about the Cedar Shore, they not only had the big hotel, which was very famous yes. in the 30s, but they put an addition on right over the bay, and that was had two floors to it. The first floor was the um, lockers and keys, where Anne wouldn't give me my key, keys to my locker because I didn't behave. The second floor was the dining room, right over the bay, and it was beautiful. We had many... Um, How about the Marine Grill? grill. The Marine Yes, grill. Oh, that's right, good. I didn't remember the name. Marine Grill. Yes, and there were yeah, they had an orchestra that played every afternoon. Yeah. And the orchestra leader used to tease me because I had freckles. So he used to play the song Freckle Face every day. <laughs> How cute. <laughs> you know, just a few bars. Yeah. Well, oh, a lot of the young, we had a lot of dances there too. Oh, yes. But the most most uh, oh, the sailing events on weekends, they were beautiful. Mm -hmm. They came from all over Avonyville, 
want to approve. That's true. Many famous people, in fact, there's a story, maybe uh, you remember it better than I do, but do you remember the, uh, what was it, the King of England before Queen Elizabeth? Edward, Edward VIII, was he at first? Duke of Windsor. Duke of Windsor. Had a, and he fell in love with a lady called Wally Simpson. And of course it was a scandal. And he couldn't become king because he wanted to marry a divorced woman. Wally Simpson, the lady that he loved, had been divorced. And the reason I'm bringing this up, she had a daughter, and which she never uh, lived up to, but it, the reason I know it is, uh, oh, it's too complicated, but Mrs. Morrison, Webb's mother, was one, my mother's best friend. And Mrs. Morrison said to my mother, don't tell anybody, Helen, but Wally Simpson's daughter is here at the Cedar Shore. She, uh, you know, and she said, I, in order to entertain the youngster, I, I want your daughter and Nancy Palmer, of course, uh, to play with her. In, in other words, entertain her. And I never heard whether that was absolutely true or not. So that was our connection with the King of England. <laughs> Interesting. Dorothy, Wally Simpson's daughter. Dorothy Morrison was one of the nicest women I ever knew. She was a very nice woman. Yes. That's Webb's mother? Yes. Webb's, Webb's mother, yes. Yeah. Webb's mother was a real lady, a lovely person, as Anne mentioned. She had to go to work to support the two children. And she went to Sweezy's. And she worked at Sweezy's and Patchog for years. The reason I uh, know this is she was my mother's good friend. They had been at similar schools in Brooklyn. And uh, that's how mother first knew her because we were all summer people originally. And uh, knew, as I say, Mrs. Morrison and my mother were perhaps the last two of that generation to live. They lasted into their 90s. Yeah, I remember I had shingles in my eye years ago. And uh, of course I lost the sight of my left eye. And uh, she was so concerned about that. Every time she came in the post office, she said, isn't there anything they can do to fix that? I said, that's what they say. Hmm. Now, Betty, you decided to become a teacher. Uh, uh, um, oh, how did I decide to become a teacher? That's easy. There weren't too many op occupations open to women. And I wanted to originally major in physics. I loved that type of science. But don't forget it. They didn't want women in physics. And uh, Walter Dickies, who was the original principal of Green Avenue Elementary School, he was elected principally, naturally, before the children came in. He rented our house on Gillette Avenue when we were in the city. And so I got to know Walter Dickies quite well. And uh, he said to me, well, what are you going to major in, or what are you interested in, Betty? Well, you know, like a teenager. So he said, well, why don't you go in for teaching? I'll hire you when you finish. And I thought, well, that sounds pretty good. So that's how I went into teaching. And believe it or not, I did. He didn't hire me, but uh, Ed Lyon did. Ed Lyon was the principal of the, uh, what was a junior high school in those days. Here in Sable? Here in Sable, yes. Shall I tell you what they called it? Huh? 
Shall I, <coughs> shall I tell you what the kids called Ed Lyons? What did they call him? Let Ed Ed. <laughs> <laughs> why? Do you know why? No, he was a very nice man. Yes, he and his wife. His wife was quite a lady. And uh, he, if he had lived, it's his granddaughter. That's right, who's the golf champion. Yes, it, his granddaughter named McDonald, Julie McDonald, is the uh, champion golfer, just to make, plus, plus she's the sanatorium of Sable High School this year. And that's Ed and Romaine Lyons' granddaughter. But of course they're both gone. I'm sorry they I told, you didn't I told, live to see it. Yes, I am too. Yeah, yeah. I, I liked Ed Lyons. And he, it was Ed Lyons who hired me, but it was Walter Dickey's who told me to go in for teaching. I guess he was gone by the time I was ready to teach. How many years did you teach? Well, that's complicated because I kept having to leave to have children. <laughs> I, I, let me say, I started in, in, in Sable in 57 and uh, retired in, eight, in uh, eight, 88, yes which I didn't even want to retire. I enjoyed, I love teaching. I really had enjoyed the kids and everything. But we're most fortunate here in Sable. We, uh, oh, of course, kids at times can be holy terrors, but they weren't mean. It was a very nice group of youngsters, and I taught there for all those years. And I, ne I had only one quote-unquote, bad kid, which was very fortunate. Oh, yes. Yeah. And did you have a career in mind when you were growing up? I had a career in mind, but I didn't have much of a future. What was the career? Because of the window, and I couldn't, I couldn't go away to school, not with my father's situation. What was that? Because he didn't make a lot of money. What was his profession? He, he was a day laborer. Okay. When you went to service, what did you learn? Did you learn a trade or? When I went in the service? Mm -hmm. Well, when I went in the service, I, uh, fortunately, I, got a, I took a, an aptitude test with uh, 700 people when I got the highest score. Wow. And uh, so therefore, when I went out of basic training, I went out with a recommendation for OC school. And I was I had to go in the field for 16 weeks. And, and I was uh, assigned to a hospital unit in Fort McClellan, Alabama. And do you know where they put me? In charge of the venereal, venereal disease section. Oh, really? <laughs> but you weren't a nurse. You no. Are? No. Okay. No. These were records. Okay. Yeah. In the Battle of the Bulge, I was riding around with records and all that kind of stuff. And I was having lunch one day, with, and I usually had it with the sergeant major at the hospital. And he said to me, don't get your hopes up, kid. And I said, why? He said, they sent your records back. He said your orders for OC school came through and they sent them back because the lack of education. That would be officer candidate school, right? No, no, that was the officer I was working for. But and what? I was doing most of her work. Okay. But and you I figured that's why she did it. But, uh, but then uh, one day when I came back from work, one of the girls who had been on night duty said, we got an excellent ex inspection again in our barracks, and I had charge of the barracks. They, they promoted me from private to sergeant, but they sent my OC orders back. What is OC? Officer Candidate School. Right, okay. And uh, so uh, uh, she said, uh, three officers came through. And one said to the other, why did this 
barracks look so much better than any, the other two. And she said, I couldn't help it. I said to him, don't you know, ma'am? Wollstonecroft lives here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, you know, the next week they sent me off to OC school. Where, where was that? Where did you? For, uh, officers training school? At Fort Des Moines, Iowa. Oh. Yeah. Did you get overseas? No. Okay. Did you want to go? No, I didn't. Uh, I was concerned about my younger brother, younger brother. He was in the Battle of the Bulge. He was in the Army Specialized Training Program. At, uh, he had a year and a half of college. And, uh, uh, they, they did away with it and, and put them into advanced units and shipped them overseas when they needed help. And he was only 19 years old. Did he come back? Yes, he came back. Did all your family come, all your brothers come back? Did you have other brothers? My, my other brother came back. Yeah. How is your garden, and did you used to have, did you used to work on your own garden? Yes, but I had mostly shrubs and, and plants. Okay. I, I just rooted uh, six akubas for Gary. So you still do it? You still do some gardening? Oh yes, I have nine African violets. Okay. Yes. What were you going to say, Ben? I, I'm just nodding in agreement. <laughs> People are very interesting, aren't they? I have one more question. Were you here? Now my husband told me this that when he was in school in Sable during part of World War II, the first part before he went in service, that they used to um, rush up to Old 88 and go up to the highest point on Old 88 to look for air enemy aircraft that oh, were... I looked, I looked. Did you do that? Oh, yes. The up upper part of Old 88? Yeah. You could uh, you could reach by stairs, yes. One more question I can think of. You were here for the 38 hurricane. Can you describe what it was like? I certainly can. I was in Robinson's real estate office and a tree came through the roof. Oh my God. And I had to climb out through the branches. Oh. My goodness! Yeah. So then, I was concerned about my grandmother, so I jotted around to, with all the wind blowing and everything in the car to Railroad Avenue, and I went in to see. And she said, "You're crazy. Go home." <laughs> <laughs> Did you have oh, water yeah. in the streets back in thirty eight, nineteen thirty eight? Was there water in the streets? No, it wasn't. We didn't have too much. We had mostly tree damage. It was it was quite amazing. Sable and Bayport and edges of Oakdale have almost been like an oasis. Yeah. We have had very. I'm crossing my fingers as I speak. Very little storm damage other than trees down our house in Sable, Gillette Avenue. Uh, all it lost in that 38 hurricane were two shingles, which was remarkable. So most of the houses weren't in too bad shape. Did you find this true? Yes. It's uh, quite amazing. And yet just a few miles east down the island, one of my good friends, her sister was in a house in West Hampton. And her sister was newly married with a baby, and both the sister, the baby, and the house were washed into the ocean. So it, uh, it was extremely serious in certain places, but a hurricane is evidently very odd in its behavior, because just a few more miles west, you see, we didn't have too much damage. In fact, 
whoever was teaching science and Sable didn't know enough. But they they let all the kids out of school at when the eye of the storm passed. They thought that was the end of the storm. Ah. Luckily, there wasn't any child loss, but there could have been just a tree falling on them or something. But uh, we know more today. Did you go into the city much growing up, Ann? I had an uncle who was a New York City policeman, and he used to come, he lived in Jackson Heights, and he used to come and get me. And uh, I spent one Christmas Eve in Radio City Music Hall, because he was on duty outside, and he took my cousin, and he was my age, and we, and we, 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 we were in there while he worked. That, did you enjoy it? What was playing? Do you remember? No, I don't remember. I was 13. And Betty, you grew up in Brooklyn. So when did your family move out here permanently? Oh, they um, they moved out here permanently in 1922. Oh, okay. They thought it was a nice place to live. 